Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit, to fill you up with hope. Today, we're going to be channeling Elizabeth Taylor. I want to specifically talk to her about Michael Jackson, one of her dear friends. I'd also like to thank her for her work with AIDS. So Elizabeth Taylor, we have channeled in the past. So if you're interested, check out the playlist for Liz Taylor. All right, so a Hollywood diva, a lady for sure. So let's feel into her energy vibration. I can feel her coming in, gorgeous brunette. She always smells so good. I'm gonna tell you guys that. I can smell her, her perfume is very thick. It's thick, it's not fruity. There's no fruitiness about her perfume. It is much more French and has a very distinct thick quality in it. It is very powerful. She says, thank you, thank you. And I, want to recognize your talent, your skill, your savvy as far as your business and your business endorsements and things. I know you actually do have perfume, a perfume line as well. So recognition of that in addition to your talent and your skill as a Hollywood starlet and I'm going to say diva because I think you've earned that. You lived a very long, very full life and had a lot of celebrity friends and so curious here at Above Life Channel to have the viewers understand or know more about that, you know, your interesting stories and your life experience. So first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for your work with AIDS and I appreciate that. And she says, oh, you're welcome. She says, oh, oh, absolutely. She says, um, I had many friends that were impacted and many, many of my friends, you know, there were so many actors that were in the closet. And for so many years, you know, she says, beginning with Rock Hudson and, you know, he died of AIDS and it wasn't well known at that time. And it was something that was very, um, was not spoken of and yet very known. Like if you were in the inner circles of Hollywood, you knew about, um, about the devastating impacts of the disease, but people tried to hide it, especially for actors. It was really important to be known as someone who was a sex symbol and that's how you got your roles, that's how you were cast. And so there was not room for someone who was gay or who preferred to be in relationships with men. It just really, there really wasn't a, a place for that in acting, in, in the movies, in television, in, you know, it was so, and it wasn't that it was uh, shameful or um, devalued as far as relationships, but because it was so re uh, prevalent, prevalent, it was so prevalent, there were so many um, gay and bisexual relationships that, it was rather accepted, but unspoken acceptance, if, if, that, if that fits, if I can say that. But I think it, it, is in, it, it is important to mention that there is much work that needs to be done globally as far as helping the children with AIDS. And now that many of the stereotypes surrounding AIDS have been opened and broke, broken open, it's the next level or the next step uh, outside of education, of course, is to provide access to health care. That's probably the most pressing, pressing issue that if I was alive today, I would take a stand for AIDS. And I would continue to do that because of so many friends of mine that lost their battles with AIDS. But the health care system in and of itself and the healthcare industry needs to be more accountable for so that the medications so that people can live with HIV prior to developing AIDS and all of the complicated illnesses that are connected to that there must be more done with the accessibility of drugs related to managing and to staying healthy with AIDS or with HIV so that it doesn't become AIDS, the actual virus of AIDS doesn't become 
past the point of no return. People can actually live actively with HIV if they have access to the medications. And, and for so many, that is not, it's not affordable and it's not accessible. And that work needs to be done on that, in that arena with healthcare related to this. You are very passionate. Oh my goodness, Elizabeth Taylor, very passionate. You come in as a diva and command the stage here at Above Life Channel, and then you shift into a platform of expressing beautifully articulated, beautifully articulated, compassionate philanthropic work for AIDS and the prevention of and to help people living with HIV. All right. Oh, beautiful. And she's showing me Bono from YouTube. So she must have worked with him or been with him in some charity organization related to this. Um, I also see George Michael. Oh, in the afterlife. Yes, she says, yes, we were friends. We were friends. She said, it doesn't have, that doesn't have to do with AIDS, <laughs> the AIDS charities, but um, he definitely is a wonderful, very talented singer. She says, very talented singer. And she says, easy on the eyes, you know. Yes. You, and that brings me to, you were friends with many musicians, not just George Michael, but um, Michael Jackson as well. And so that's someone that I know that many viewers will be curious about. Um, very publicly, you were connected with Michael Jackson and, and you know that he went through so much late in his life in regards to, you know, allegations against him in regards to his relationships with children and, um, was prosecuted and now the estate is actually being there's lawsuits that are coming up from kids and who are now adults and um, I don't want to really get into all the legal stuff but I'm curious about how how you how do you feel about Michael Jackson and his his when he was a person his state can you describe the person Michael Jackson that you knew his state of being his mind you know how you knew him she says um, well he had many enduring qualities it was easy to like him he felt very um, he did have a feeling of being almost submissive, um, uh, very, uh, ch he, very childlike in, in many ways, which I think is very appealing for people because he didn't seem like someone that would, um, he, seemed, he seemed as though someone that needed to be taken care of, not someone that would take care of others. And so, so did it surprise you that he had children of his own? No, it didn't surprise me at all. Not at all. He was very loving and he genuinely felt I, f I think that the best way to describe this would be lonely, that he felt very alone. Like he couldn't ever fully be himself and by having children of his own or having his own family, it's sort of a way to provide him some comfort where he could just be, he could be playful and youthful and that those childlike qualities could be very beneficial in the relationship with his own children. And so I think as a father, I mean, he was very loving and very caring and, and so, so kind and Discipline was not his strong suit. He's not, he's not the type of, of a disciplinarian that you might expect of a father figure or a role model, but he, instead he led by example. And I think the discipline that his children could learn would be from his work ethic and his commitment to his work. When, when you could see when he was getting ready for his tours and the creative process, I and mean, he was a brilliant creative genius he was so he was brilliant when it came to music and and choreography and it was so it was so incredible the the art that he was able to share 
who's very, very, very brilliant, just brilliant. But he could be very, very solemn and very um, sad at times. And I think that's, that's not uncommon for people who are very, very famous. There's a lot, there's a lot of demand upon your time and, and there's so much pressure and not just to perform, but to always be in that performance mode can be quite difficult. And, and for many of us, for many, many of us, we share that understanding and it's kind of sad that that's what can bring you together, but it's true. And Brooke, uh, Brooke Shields was also a good friend of Michael's and she was a, a wonderful young woman that I, came to know and and um, and appreciate the relationship and the connection. I, I also knew Lisa Marie as well. And um, I did know Priscilla a bit, although I knew I knew much more of Elvis, but we didn't run in the same circles, but I, I knew much more of who he was and then met Priscilla at um, some social engagements and gatherings, but not, not specifically uh, friends or friendships, but uh, Lisa Marie much more because, you know, Michael would chat with me. He would talk to me and ask me for advice. And he'd say, Liz, what do I, you know, how do I, how do I win her heart? How do I, how do I make her happy? She's just, I don't feel like she's happy. And how do I make her, how can I make her happy? And, you know, what do I do? What do I do? And, and asking me for advice, you know, because someone who's been in many marriages, I, I suppose he looked at me for advice for that. But I just said, you just have to be true to yourself and you have to let her be who she is. And whatever that is, you can't control that or change that. You have to just be the best man that you can be and the best husband you can be and support her. That's what you need to do. And unfortunately, sometimes people just grow apart or priorities change and it just, it doesn't, it's just not meant to be. It doesn't work out. Okay. All right. So wow, we're talking about a lot of different things. Um, can you talk a little bit about your... Let's see, let me ask you this. Did you have connections with his children, with Michael's children at all? Um, she's, she's saying sort of like a, uh, a god grandmother, so to speak, like not a godmother direct, but like a grandmother that's a godmother, kind of looking out for them. Um, she says they had, they had a loving family and so, some of the craziness or the things that you you heard of or saw in the tabloids were not um, were not the norm. We're not we're atypical of the experience of the children growing up, and and I can understand why Michael was very protective about um, pictures with his 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 children because they're so young. They needed to be really sh um, shielded from so much of the 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 trauma that Michael incurred or he felt he incurred as as a child being famous and how it impacted him so deeply he just really wanted to protect his children from that and so I can understand some of the lengths that he went to to keep them protected but the truth is is all parents want to protect their children and he really couldn't you can live in a bubble for so long and then it's considered weird or strange or out or you're an out or um, you're an outcast or they're, it's outrageous and and it's really hard to understand the thoughts and the motivations behind that when it's quite simple really it's just a parent um, uh, uh, wanting to take care of their children wanting to protect their child it's a natural instinct I believe all right so how do you feel about oh there's a little Oh, be right here in just a second. Oh my goodness sakes. Let's blow it away. Go, go, go. Thank you. <laughs> one of the one of the hazards, I guess, of channeling outside on a beautiful summer's day. 
So, okay, so we've talked about Michael a bit. Let's talk about some other stories or some other things that you'd like to share. I feel like you keep bringing up the name Arthur or Art. I'm not sure who that is. And I feel like Art, you're mentioning someone named Art. Um, I'm not sure who that is. I feel like it's somebody famous around the famous arena, but I'm not sure exactly who it is. He looks older than you, quite a bit older than you. Um, I also see what looks like Frank Sinatra from the side, and then I also see um, Eddie? Eddie Fisher, it must be Eddie Fisher, who you, I think you were married to twice, I think. On again, off again. You know, she says the heart wants what the heart wants. She says the heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> she says, I'm always going to be seen as the bad guy, aren't I? You know, the one, the woman who steals your man. I guess you could say. But it's bygones in the afterlife. She says there is not, there is not um, ill will or ill feelings between any of us. And she's referring to Carrie Fisher and her mom, Donna, and wait, Debbie? To her mom, Debbie? I think it's Debbie. And uh, Eddie also. So there's all this, there's like this drama, you know, around that. And she says, there's no, there's no, it's bygones. She says, bygones. In the afterlife, there's really not that hanging on to or holding a grudge that human people that we have is what she's making me feel like, so. Oh well, yeah, it's Debbie Reynolds, okay? Because I literally see the two of them like, you know, like hugging or greeting each other and that kind of a thing. It's like wholesome girl meets the, the diva, um, very, I don't know the words I want to use, but she's very, like an enchantress or something, an temptress kind of, <laughs> kind of a thing. She says, oh, I call it, call it what you will. She says, call it what you will. She's so classy, you guys. She has such a, like she knows her power, you know? She really, Miss Cleopatra, I mean, she knows her power. She knows energy. Ah, oh, you know who I would love to talk to you about, Elizabeth Taylor? I would love to talk to you about Ms. Marilyn Monroe. Would you like to chat about that? She says, I bet you would. And she's got beautiful, like a red, a pink fuchsia red lip, kind of. That's like three different colors, but Li Elizabeth Taylor has like lipstick all of a sudden that's not bright red, but a little bit more pink. I think she's like giving a nod to Marilyn Monroe. And she says, yes, but you, I, wouldn't you like to talk about Ms. Marilyn Monroe? Yes, I would. I think that's great. Marilyn's one of my faves. I love Marilyn Monroe. And um, us blondes got to stick together, I guess. And my understanding is that you were like major competition for her. Like she saw you or perceived you as major competition. She says, well, we were, we were at um, competing studios. And so there's definitely a, a rivalry between the studios. And, you know, a lot of that is concocted. A lot of that is drama filled in uh, us just playing parts. You know, when you encounter that person, you, you play the part. So I, I didn't have any, any malice toward Marilyn at all in, in, in any way. I felt that she had her niche and I had mine. And I felt like she was uh, a, a comedic actress and that there were roles for both of us. I wasn't concerned about her uh, talent and taking any of my roles or anything like that. But we were at different studios and so we had different contracts. and. So there really wasn't ever going to be that kind of a competition or rivalry individually. But there was a perception that there was because of the drama that was created, I think, by the studios in part in the competition between the studios because the, she's like, the men that are, were running the studios were very much in competition. And it was a money game and a numbers game. And the more movies you could put out, the more revenue you could generate. It wasn't like you'd have one movie and then wait a long time and then have another one. And then it was who was hot was hot. And you had multiple movies by the same 
actresses or actors as stars or leads and that gave a a momentum a boost in revenue for the studio and so whoever had the hottest movie stars at the time were were on top of the box office so in that regard we were pitted against one another you know the brunette and the blonde and although i could have been perceived as having more serious roles and and in turn then when i was at events or social gatherings and promotional parties and things, I would carry myself in that way, I really hold myself to the roles that I wanted to have and the characters I wanted to portray and really held myself I, with those high expectations, unless I had a few too many cocktails and then all bets are off. Then you might get me to sing, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So when you and Marilyn encountered each other, was there any like cattiness or ill feelings or that kind of a thing? Only to play a part, only, only so far as it was acting, you know, it was, it was only so far as it could further our careers individually. I think you could maybe perceive my behavior as uh, being better than or acting as though I'm better than, but that's all part of the, the facade. That's all part of acting, darling. That's all part of acting. It's all part of the show. And you give people what they come for, right? I do feel though that it, it's, it's quite sad how her feelings, her emotions were very much on her sleeve. She, she very much wanted the attention and the recognition of, of so many and she never really felt, I, I don't believe that she ever really felt like she, she attained that. But, but we weren't friends, we weren't close friends. We, we had some of the same friends, uh, Joan and I, and um, she sang, I can't tell if she sang Mary Ellen or Marion. Marlene, I think it's Marlene. Um, so she's mentioning a Joan, which I'm thinking is Joan Crawford. And then she's mentioning a Marlene or Marlena, Marlena as well. And she says, we had some of the same acquaintances, but it wasn't, there wasn't really a rivalry. It was only a facade or mystique. It truly wasn't a personal thing. On From my perspective, it was not a personal. I, I was not threatened by Marilyn. I wasn't concerned about Marilyn. And, and I would respect her, uh, her talent as an actress, but I, I felt like she was much more of a musical or a um, comedic type of an actress. And, and I didn't fit into those genres those weren't my natural, um, those weren't where I really wanted to be long term, longer term or such. I had, I had much more serious roles in mind for myself. And if that is c conceived as being better than or feeling as though I am better than, then perhaps that's just a reflection of how you are, are receiving me. But I did feel, I felt sorry for her loss when, when she was pregnant and she miscarried. I felt, I did feel a great deal of compassion for her and knowing how, how difficult that is to lose a child or to be, to miscarry or to not be able to have, have a child is, uh, heartbreaking and so I felt very um, a great deal of compassion and sympathy I, I ached with her um, from afar as women do as we do from afar and in our own quiet you know there's so much more to us than to us Hollywood actresses to what you would consider starlets or the old Hollywood genre or theme. 
there's so much more to us and I hope that you can discover that in your conversations. I hope that you can discover that. And then perhaps it will help you to see your own life differently. And to ask the questions of what's really happening here? Because sometimes it can be quite easy to jump to conclusions and to make assumptions when you only get one side or even two sides of a story. There's multiple views of a story. We're all living in a fishbowl, my dear. We're all living in a fishbowl. The best thing to do is be as transparent and as full as you possibly can be and focus on your goals and what it is that you want to experience and accomplish in your life. And that is your priority. So. Ms. Elizabeth Taylor, we could talk so much more. I want to talk so much more to you about love and about um, your leading men and all sorts of stuff, but this video is getting rather long, and so I look forward to the opportunity, Ms. Elizabeth Taylor, to chat with you in the future if I may do so. And I want to thank you very much for sharing about Michael Jackson and talking about your work with AIDS and talking, mentioning some of the other celebrities and people that you've known at connected with, as well as, of course, Marilyn Monroe as well. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you. Thank you. I'm Bridget. It's been my pleasure to be able to connect for you with Ms. Ms. Elizabeth Taylor in the afterlife. Remember, the purpose here at Above Life Channel is to inspire your spirit, to fill you with hope, because this, oh, this is your life. This is your life. So live it. Just live it. Thanks for watching.